Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the Metalla Royalty and Streaming Update webinar. My name is Christina Pilon, Investor Relations for Metalla. I am pleased to introduce our president and CEO, Brett Heath, who will be presenting on behalf of the company today. Uh, also, Vice President of Corporate Development, Drew Clark, Corporate Development Associate, Sunny Sarah, CFO, Saurabh Handa, and Non-Executive Director, Evie Tucker. Uh, Brett will give a brief update on Metalla and uh, followed by um, a, a few slides by members of the team, followed by a Q&A period. If you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A window on your screen, and we will try to address as many as time permits. If we're not able to answer your questions today, feel, please feel free to reach out to me at info at metalloroyalty.com. Uh, a recording of this webcast will be posted to our website and shared via Twitter and our LinkedIn accounts. And a copy of our investor pre presentation is available on the website. With that, Brett, over to you. Thanks, Christina. And good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you for joining us today for our October 2021 uh, Metal Royalty webinar. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, we're going to be going through a couple uh, recent, very exciting acquisitions. Uh, we've got several uh, asset updates that we're going to touch on. You know, we're seeing some very significant advancements in some of our portfolio assets. Um, and we'll also hear from uh, E.B. Tucker, author of Why Gold, Why Now? Um, but before we get into that, you know, we've been hearing a lot about a specific topic that I'd like to discuss and can I think how that plays into our company. And if you're a royalty investor today, you're probably well aware of this topic. That's M&A, that's mergers and acquisitions. We have seen a bit of an uptick uh, recently in the sector and, and mergers and acquisitions or M&A is, is a healthy thing. You know, we live in a world today where there are more royalty companies that ever existed at the same time. You know, we're seeing probably some of the most competitive environments for, for assets that, that we've also ever seen. I mean, really it's a perfect storm. And, and we believe that that trend is likely to continue over the next kind of one to two years. Um, now what's important to understand is, is as an investor is how the company that you're invested in is positioned for this period. And there's four points of, of what I believe is strength that Metalla possesses that I think is going to allow us to be able to not only navigate, maximize uh, the opportunities that come up, but, but really be able to benefit over the next two years. And the, the first point that I want to share with you, and, and these are points that you can really compare across the whole sector to any royalty company or gold royalty company that you're invested in. Uh, but the first one is really deal flow. Um, you got to be able to have your own sourced deal flow. Just this year, um, again, in what has been one of the most competitive years that I've ever seen, um, you know, Metalla has done a record seven acquisitions, seven acquisitions this year. Uh, the year is not even over yet. Um, we did that through the first about nine months of, of the calendar year. Um, and these are acquisitions on multi million ounce deposits across proven geological trends that are being advanced by the largest mining companies in the world, you know, the types of acquisitions that you want. Uh, but most importantly, these were so sourced bilaterally. That means just the company and the seller of the assets, which is, you know, how we've been able to deliver a lot of accretive value to you as shareholders. Um, another important point is really the float and liquidity of the company that you're invested in. At, at Metalla, um, you know, we've been able to build and control our capital structure. We've got upwards of 90% float in our company. Um, and what this means is that we've got no big chunky shareholders. Our largest shareholder is the GDXJ um, at just over 5% and then BD Capital, who we have a very, very close uh, working relationship with. They've been just an incredible shareholder and, and have really supported us through our growth phase over the last few years. Um, but what that does is it, it allows the company that you're invested in really to be in the driver's seat because big chunky shareholders sometimes don't have the same interest as the, the common shareholder uh, in these companies. So that's another very significant or position of strength that, uh, that I think that, that we'll have through, through this coming um, period. Um, the third is the growth. You know, having the built-in growth is so important in your business. Um, 
over the last five years through the 27 public transactions that we've completed acquiring 70 royalties you know we've always focused on growth and that really the value that we saw was really in the development side of the business these these are these are royalties that are on development assets again most of them with the same characteristics across the proven geological trends being advanced by these major mining companies. Um, but th this was done for a purpose because now we have the growth built in. We don't have the pressures that, that some companies would have um, in periods like this where they may be forced to compete in, in competitive processes um, that can often result in, in capital destruction for, for shareholders. Um, and the, the fourth or the, the last but not least is access to capital. It's so important to have as many possible tools as you can in your toolbox to be able to use at the specific time that's really going to be able to, um, you're really going to be able to pull on the, on the different tools to be able to maximize the value for your shareholders. And, and this year, 2021, we have deployed more capital than we have in any other year in our in our business. And we've been able to do that through uh, utilizing our convertible facilities with BD Capital. We've been able to raise um, over 30 million US in the last 12 months through our ATM facility. That's our at the market facility, which gives us the flexibility to cross in vetted institutional shareholders that that are not only there to help support the company today but we believe will support the company in the future and so all of these are our big value adds as we move into um you know this new environment that i think we're already seeing that the early signs for so um we're really excited about the rest of this year 2022 i think is going to be even bigger um and uh and, and you know, we hope that, that you as shareholders are, are excited as well. So with all that said, I will pass it off to our corporate development team, uh, Drew Clark and Sunny Sar to walk you through the, the recent updates here that we're gonna cover today. Hi there, um, I, I have everyone to look at the four looking statements. It's standard language, but should be at least uh, preface before we get into our conversation. Um, as Brett mentioned, today was our, or sorry, not today, this year was our busiest yet. Here's a look back in the last 12 months. We've done eight transactions, bringing in 17 royalties. Um, in aggregate, we deployed 74 million in capital. And if you add up all of the consensus analyst estimates for the net asset value of those, it uh, works out to a little over 114 million. If you back that out, that works out to about a price to NAV of 0 0.65, which is relevant as a lot of our peers are deploying capital uh, in the one to 1 1.2 times range. Um, one thing I would highlight though, is of these eight transactions, six of them were on $1 billion plus top tier operators. And as Brett is gonna wrap up later in the, in the presentation, you'll see that the prices are consistently below what our peers are paying, um, which is not, not the norm for assets with such great counterparties. Um, I'm gonna quickly highlight some of the deals we've done since our last webinar, along with Sunny, uh, who works with us in the corporate development group here along with some very noteworthy developments in the portfolio. But if anyone really wants to get in more depth, contact myself, Christina, Brett, anyone, or you can refer to our MDNA. Every quarter we put it out. It's a very comprehensive, if not exhaustive list of the entire portfolio of 70 royalties, where we track these very closely and update them as, as they come along. The first, and I guess the most uh, noteworthy deal that we did was just over a month ago, I think it was a, uh, a month ago and a day, was the Castle Royalty, which we paid $15 million US for. It's a 5% NSR on what will be one of the top 10 gold mines when it's ramped up uh, in the next five, six years. It's being operated by the team at Equinox, one of the fastest growing mid-tiers in the game. It's got a very noteworthy uh, chairman, Ross Beatty, one of the most prolific mining entrepreneurs. And what we're excited about this is not only is it being pushed forward and on already on an operating mine, uh, we believe there's a real opportunity to, to join the two pits which, um, where we have a royalty on South Domes um, and also ultimately move it forward in the production plan. Two years ago, roughly in April of 2019, we acquired a, a portfolio of assets from Alamos. Since we acquired that portfolio, one of the sort of flagship, flagship royalties within it was an asset called Wazimac. We have a 1.5% royalty on it. 
we're really excited about it. Since acquiring the project, Yamana has expanded the reserve, expanded the throughput, and made a discovery. And they just acquired the project in the summer. They're now talking about running at 200,000 ounces a year for over 15 years or more at the asset. When we bought this off Alamos, it was slated for 155 to 160,000 ounces over roughly an 11 year mine life. So they see potential to grow the asset, increase the, the production profile and you know really aggressively drill it. They're gonna do almost 70,000 meters in the next 18 months. Um, it's a great example of where the royalty model comes into play for shareholders. This is obviously no cost to any of us. Last, the last one I'd like to highlight here is the Token Zinio mine. This we acquired originally when El Dorado had it. Since they've, since we acquired the royalty, uh, a group called G Mining acquired the asset. Now, for those who don't know who G Mining is, this is under the stewardship of Louis Gignac. He's built four mines, some for Newmont, most notably the, the recent one was FDN for London Gold, each time under budget or on or ahead of schedule. So these are proven mine builders that are buying buying what is now their flagship asset. 10 days after they bought the asset, they did a bot deal, really well subscribed, uh, really good institutional following. They're building this mine ahead of schedule as to where we thought it would be when we originally bought it. Very quickly on, on the exploration ground here, as you can see on the slide here, it's really been untouched um, in terms of the property package, less than 5% of uh, the almost 700 square kilometers has been drill tested. And below the current pit shell, they've had some absolutely great uh, holes that are probably going to push this thing a little bit deeper um, without even stepping out or getting too um, um, aggressive with the drill bit. I'm going to hand this off to Sunny Sarah, who's, uh, who's going to go into some of the other assets. Thanks, Drew. So uh, earlier, or a few months ago, we uh, announced the acquisition of a 1.35% royalty on the Cote mine. This is the Iron Gold's next development asset. It's currently in production as a 7.2 million ounce uh, reserve estimate um, and is expected to do about 500,000 ounces a year beginning in 2023. Um, our royalty covers about 6% of the reserves um, and our royalty also covers the Gosselin zone. Um, so in the anticipated mine life of the uh, Cote deposit, the uh, uh, production decreases from about 500,000 to 370,000 uh, ounces a year. And I Am Gold is hoping to supplement the mill with the Gosselin ore where they're hoping to release a resource estimate of about three to 5 million ounces of gold. Um, and recently they released some drill results where they've had uh, a large amount of successful drilling where uh, they've hit holes of 0.95 grams per ton over 430 meters, 1.41 uh, grams per ton over 393 meters. And just moving on to the next slide, Drew, please. Um, you can see that um, when they originally released the three to five million ounce uh, re uh, resource estimate or expiration estimate um, in March, on the left side, the block model was a lot smaller and expiration drilling has shown that this thing just continues to get bigger and it's starting to look like it's getting very close to the Cote pit. So it, there is potential that, or we think there's potential that this could become a very large pit, uh, perhaps even a super pit. Um, and just some recent developments going on to some of our assets um, on the next slide. Um, Recently, the uh, Ignico Ego and Kirkland Lake merger has provided some synergies for Metalla as well. Um, the uh, amalgamated Kirkland uh, royalty is one that we acquired for about 700,000 Canadian um, earlier this year. Uh, it has about almost a 700,000 ounce uh, resource estimate. And this AK ore body is almost 100 meters away from the South Mine Complex at Macassa. So there's immediately synergies for Ignico Ego to go and mine this, and the grades are very similar. It also uh, brings up the potential for uh, exploration upside at the South Mine Complex way underground, as it seems that the uh, ore body may be venturing off onto the uh, AK property as well. Um, other developments um, include the uh, Wharf Mine. Uh, recently completed a site visit there. Uh, they've been 
producing uh, and hitting their targets, even exceeding them at 85 to 95,000 ounces of gold a year. We hold a 1% GBR there that is currently producing, and they've had some great draw results uh, in filling some of the resources to potentially extend the mine life. Some of these hits include 7.5 grams per ton over 36 meters and 4.1 grams per ton over 61 meters. Um, and our, as Drew has mentioned before, um, our MDNA has a lot of our updates on some of these assets. Some other noteworthy ones include Aerolito, where there is uh, pre-stripping activities that have begun. So open pit mining will soon begin. <coughs> and uh, at Santa Gertrudis, where there have been some high grade uh, discoveries that they've highlighted some really good draw results from as well. <clears throat> so uh, I think next I'll move it back to Brett. Over to you, Brett. Thanks, Sonny and Drew for uh, the, the asset updates here. I mean, obviously we've got some great things going on and uh, you know, we, hope, we hope that you guys are just as excited as we are. Um, but you know, again, uh, you know, we, we wanna point out, <clears throat> we, we've been able to execute on just some incredible assets and, and that is really kind of the key, you know, being able to buy high quality deals at accretive prices um, the chart that you see or the, the graph that you see in front of us here uh, is just the last couple years of acquisitions that we've had. You'll notice uh, the royalties are again across uh, a, a very diversified blend of some of the largest operators, more importantly, um, consistently at accretive prices um, as these things are continuing to be advanced. And so this is what we've set out to deliver um, from the very beginning across all 27 acquisitions. And this is what we'll continue to deliver uh, over and over again as we continue growing our business um, and, and adding value kind of one, one asset at a time as, as we grow here. Um, a new chart that we put together, um, if we can flip to the next page, is, is really highlighting the growth here that we have and, and why we're so excited. Um, about everything that we've done over the last five years. Um, and what you'll see here is, um, you know, obviously we've got five assets that are producing. Um, those have all been, been going very well, uh, but the bulk of the value here is really in the growth. Again, it's the growth that's built in already that's paid for. We're seeing huge amounts of organic growth on top of this, but right here is, is the, the gold equivalent production of upwards of two dozen assets. So you've got upwards of two dozen assets that are being advanced by the largest gold companies across some of the most well-known proven gold deposits in the world. Um, and these assets are advancing in production. You know, We should see a different asset come online every single year for the next decade. Um, and just over the next five years in our portfolio today, based on the, um, on the guidance um, from these larger operators, you know, we could see upwards of 20,000 ounces a year of gold equivalent production. Um, so we're really at the stage of this company where we've got a huge amount of growth. Um, again, all of that growth is paid for. Um, almost every single one of these projects is being self-financed by these majors. This is what you wanna see um, with your royalty company. You don't wanna see financing risk. You don't wanna see the risks that you typically see with smaller operations and smaller mining companies. You want to see the Newmonts, the Yamanas, the Equinoxes, the Cores, the Barracks, the Pan American Silvers. These companies know how to build mines. They know how to generate value. And we're buying royalties on projects that are in their pipeline that they're spending significant amounts of capital on. Uh, and really it all comes back to the bottom line for, for our investors. So. Um, so thank you know thank you all for uh, for for listening to this update. I'd like to uh, pass it over to EB here um, to to see what his latest thoughts are on the markets. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining the the webinar, and thank you more importantly for uh, being a supportive shareholder of Metalla. Uh, I, I thought I would just kind of tell you about something I read recently that that I really enjoyed. There's a, a guy that recommend recommended Mattel in his newsletter. His name is Chris Weber. 
uh, Weber Global Opportunities. And, and he, he uh, took a, a segment of an article that Richard Russell wrote uh, years ago about uh, the difference between a wealthy man and a uh, wealthy woman, uh, regardless of gender, and someone that just has some money. And he goes into detail and he explains that most, as we all know, most people lose money in the market. Uh, the, the, most, the, the most successful people on the average are people that have an account and forget they have an account. And they've done studies where the people, you know, they forget to log in and 10 years later, the account's up a lot because they didn't mess with it. And so Richard Russell, uh, you know, he's since passed, as everyone knows, but he wrote this piece about the mindset of the wealthy investor and how if you're getting started, what you want to do is you want to emulate the wealthy investor do what the wealthy investor does, think like the wealthy investor, and kind of pattern your decision making like the wealthy investor, because the investor that just has a little bit of money is, tends to be very jumpy, uh, struggles with patience, uh, wants to buy something that's very hot so that he can tell people that it's hot, and they'll be excited, and they'll think more of him, you know, think, think boy, are you smart, you know, you bought the, the latest crypto coin or something, and you um, and that mindset tends to, to uh, over time, to create a lot of trouble, you know, for, for building and growing wealth. And, and so uh, the, reason, the reason I share that is because uh, Brett and I put this company together. I mean, just in fairness, Brett's done all the actual hard work. But when this was five years ago, when this was starting, the, the, the idea here was to build the company that we wanted to put our own life savings into. The, what company do we want to own? How do, how do we want exposure? We've been in this business a long, long time, and, and you can't find exactly what we're looking for. We can't go back to 1987 and buy Franco Nevada or something. Or we can't go back to 1999 and buy Royal Gold. It's not possible. The business has changed for those companies. What, how can we create something that we want to own? And, and, and I'm trying to explain all the time to people that I'm close with in my, in my life that ask me this question. And you don't want to own something that's, that's hot, you know, and the message board people are thrilled about it because you bought the hottest deal from the most popular, you know, seller in Toronto or something. And you got a nice headline and everybody's going to get involved in your stock and then they're going to sell it and it's going to go down. It's, it's, you've seen this a hundred times. What you want is you want to, to have exposure to hundreds of thousands of ounces of gold locked in the ground that companies are going to slowly bring up uh, over the next 30 years or so. And as the costs rise, which we all know the inflation's rising. I just did an interview earlier today with, with Stansbury Media. It'll come out tomorrow. Hope you'll all see it where we talk about, um, the, the, she keeps asking me, well, the Fed says inflation is transitory. Yeah, well, what do you say? You know, you, you, do, you have, do you use gas? Do you have a power bill? Do you, do you go to the grocery store? I mean, do, you, do you eat food? I mean, what, what do you say? You're more important than the Fed. Who cares what they say? There's never been a time when they've warned you about something. And it's been a prescient warning. Never once. They didn't warn you about the housing crisis. They didn't warn you about the tech stock blow up. They didn't give you a, a tip to buy Bitcoin when it was a dollar. They didn't do anything to help you. But now all of a sudden they tell you, don't worry about the inflation. And you say, well, I'm not worried about the inflation. Well, so what, what, what we're seeing, and we're seeing this all around the world. I mean, you can look at Argentina, 50% you know, inflation, 35% uh, interest on government bonds. In the US, it's, it's 5 or 6% inflation, maybe more. We could argue about that. But 1.5%. Uh, uh, return on the 10-year treasury. So what we see all around the world is that the inflation is running much hotter than the, than the safe return on investments. And what does that mean? It means that if you're an average person saved up 100 grand, you know, you're, you're just losing the difference between those two numbers every year because it costs you more and more to live. And then you, you, you can't get a return on your, on your invested dollars. And so what do you do? What do you do? Well, what, I'll tell you what we've done. I mean, I mean I've, I've been at this a long time. And what I've decided to do is, is, is to buy as many shares of Metalla as I can possibly handle, um, which, you know, it seems like a lot. I mean, it, it, it's a relative amount. But the reason why, it, it, and you notice I haven't sold any, any stock, is because what I see happening is at some point the, the hot 
SPACs, the hot coins that are being offered, you know, pizza coin and garlic coin and all these things that come out every day. There's 30,000 of these coins that come out. Everybody that I, that I hear tell me about these coins is explaining to me how it's very cheap, the coin, and then it's going to be very expensive and they're going to sell it to someone else and they're going to make a bunch of money. It's going to change their life. I, I'm, I hear this all the time. Well, once this stops and all of a sudden pizza coin is hard to get rid of, you know, I, people turn around and they say, well, what do I do? What do I, what do I own? There's going to be one move in the gold market. That's it. Just one move. I mean, and, and we're not talking about like $10,000 gold. I mean, we're just talking, let's just say 2,500, 3,000, whatever. There's going to be one move. It's not going to go somewhere and then come back and give you a heads up that you know one it's oh yeah well we, we sorry you missed the first ride we'll come back we'll get you we'll go again that's it and brett's talking about mergers and acquisitions if you're paying attention to the business there's there's companies that are buying up small royalty companies the the, the bigger companies are, are struggling to get deals done they're doing kind of uh, more unique and different things they haven't done before with other metals. There's a lot of interesting things happening. There's a bit of a scarcity effect going on. And uh, as we all know, the number of ounces of gold produced is going down. The amount of money invested in the gold market to find new gold is going down. So there's less new gold mines coming online. And interest in gold has been zero or less than zero. But meanwhile, there's not that much gold available. So you have this setup where jittery, uh, impatient, novice investors that tend to make a little bit of money and then lose a lot of money are very, are very frustrated and not interested. But the Richard Russell type thinking person, the, the person that realizes that to create serious wealth, you, you have to think carefully about where you put your money and you have to be very, very uh, certain about what type of risk you want to take on because you see something coming in the future and you want to be prepared in advance for that. And you want to own something that will inflate uh, like a gigantic balloon that starts to inflate. And then as it inflates more and more, it, it, it creates this, this surge in, in value that would not be possible from any sort of work effort in life. That, that's, that's the thing that it's very difficult for people to see is, is that when you, when you find this, when you find this opportunity to, to, to boost uh, wealth in this way, you realize that it only goes one time. And it reminds me of, I bought real estate in 2010 uh, in Florida and it was a very, very scary time to buy real estate. People were very, very negative. Even the real estate brokers were negative. They, they were saying, you know, you should really think twice about this. It was not an exciting time. However, you're buying rental real estate at, at times $10 a square foot. And so, and so as that goes, you don't get the chance to go back and buy it again. Nobody says like, well, sorry, you missed it. You know, let's rewind the tape and let you go again. You had to have a hunch. You had to be confident about that hunch. And then you had to be prepared to own whatever you bought, even if things don't get better. And so I, I, the reason why I say that is because um, obviously I'm fond of the company where I'm a director. I'm fond of the team that's talked to you today, uh, you know, sitting on the board. I've handpicked that team. Uh, I'm extremely happy with them. You know, I, I, when I meet with them in person, I, I'm, I'm always thrilled to, to watch them grow and to tackle the business and to go out and do my bidding because I'm a shareholder. And so, and so to be able to choose the team that goes out every day and builds the value of my personal investment is, is really thrilling. And so, you know, I'm happy that everyone is here today and, and I hope that, that you'll get a sense for what we're doing and what we're continuing to do, regardless of uh, day-to-day uh, jittery fluctuations, you know, we, we have a plan and we think it's a good plan. When the facts change, we try to change uh, as well. And so, and so we hope to carry through the end of this year and into next year. And, and you'll see more and more that during this period of choppy markets, uh, we were up to something 
And, and that something, that fundamental kind of effort every day uh, pays off. That, that, that's, our, that's our hope for this time. So I, I hope that gives everyone a sense of, of what we're thinking and I'll uh, turn it back over to Brett. Thanks, Evie. So we'll, we'll, run, we'll run through some of the questions here on the Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in now. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to get through all of them, but we'll, we'll do our best here to uh, get as many as we can here. Uh, first question that I see here is on the, the BD convertible loan. Um, currently, uh, we've got um, <clears throat> 8 million. We, we recently drew an additional 3 million to fund the Castle Mountain acquisition. Um, and the question was really around kind of the 8% rate um, and, and the expense of that rate. And I think one thing to point out about the, the, the BD convertible loan is that when, 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 those th when those shares convert at the time that we, is that, we, that we issued the convertible loan or increased the convertible loan, those shares were priced at a 20% premium to the 30-day view app. So even though there is an 8% cost um, we're able to raise capital at an equity price that's 20% higher. Um, oftentimes, if you're going to the equity markets, it often includes an even a bigger discount to raise that capital, um, which could end, end, end inevitably be a 30% spread difference between the capital that we can get from BD uh, and the capital that, that would be available through the traditional means of, of equity financing. Um, and so that's really important. And it's also important to note that, you know, out of the millions of dollars that we've had through BD Capital, they've converted everything so far um, outside the, the eight to, um, to equity. So again, it's, it's just a tool in the toolbox that we can use specifically during times of uh, when the share price is low um, or when the share price is high. Um, it, it can work and, and give us, you know, more tools in our tool shed to be able to make sure that, that we're doing our best job at when we're acquiring these acquisitions to do them on, on the most accretive way possible. Uh, we've got another uh, question on dividends. Um, again, dividends is something that's always at the top of our mind. Um, you know, our, our, our asset portfolio right now um, is really strong enough at this point to be able to start to consider turning the dividend back on. Um, you know, this year, especially in 2021, you know, we, we like I said earlier in the, in the presentation, you know, this has been our biggest year. So we, we really had to reach for, for all the, ca the capital available to be able to get these deals done and, and inside Metalla. And you know, we feel that um, you know, this, this year especially, we, we pushed extremely hard because we kind of saw the way that the sector was moving. We kind of realized that um, you know, over the next couple of years, it, it, you know, there may be more competition. It may be more difficult to, to get these, these assets you know, specifically at the accretive prices that we were buying them at. So we, we really made a push. Um, and we feel that that delivered a, a, a significant amount of more value than, um, than the capital return. But the capital return is, is on our minds. We, you know, we evaluate that every quarter and um, you know, we'll continue to do that and hope to initiate that back on here um, in the not too distant future. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a question on, let's see here. Uh, peak silver, uh, we, you know, we can't, look, we're, we're bullish gold, we're bullish silver. Um, just personally, uh, you know, I, I think that there, there is obviously a, a very um, significant macro setup on precious metals. Um, so we are positive on that. That being said, um, you know, when we're doing transactions, we, we do not price higher metal prices. You know, we use, for the most part, you know, a consensus pricing, which is, which is usually a tailed off lower price. Um, we've, uh, got a question on, uh, M&A again, uh, you know, hostile type of, of, uh, of potential acquisitions. Um, you know, as I noted in kind of my opening remarks of this webinar, you know, I believe Metal is in just a great position of strength, uh, to navigate over the next two years. I, I think I think that the next two years will present some pretty amazing opportunities um, for us to grow the business. And so, 
it's it's just it's good to be ready for it and to be proactively thinking about how um, you know how you're going to be able to operate in new environments. And so I think I think Mattel, Mattel has done a really great job doing that. And I think we're again in, in a very um, significant position of strength going forward here. Um, we've got a question on uh, the the share price. Uh, you know, we along with the rest of the sector have experienced um, a, a consolidation. Um, you know, the gold price has been in consolidation for a little over a year now, um, and you know, year to date. Um, you know, our, our stock, I believe, is down, you know, right around kind of 40, 50% range. Now, it's important to understand the context of that, because uh, if you just go back 12 months, you know, I believe we're almost flat on the last 12 months, which is probably, I think, better than the ma majority of the sector. And if you go back um, two or three years, we're up um, hundreds of percents. Uh, from from the early days, and, and we've actually had um, in the last five years a number of of pretty significant corrections um, as we've built our business. You know, the market doesn't always uh, line up exactly with the value of the company. Sometimes it overshoots. Sometimes it's way below. And what I can say is, right now, this is the cheapest that we've seen our stock. Um, in the last three years, so if you if 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 you didn't buy the stock at, at two dollars a share, um, you know I'm telling you from a valuation perspective today, it's it's just as or more of attractive as it is today as it was back then, and so that's the opportunity, and really that's the opportunity going forward, um, potentially uh, as as we continue to grow our business, we think there's lots of of great things ahead of us here. Um, <clears throat> We've got a question for EB um, on uh, any any potential uh, thoughts on targets for what the gold and silver price will do over uh, the next six months or twelve months. Near term, near term, long term targets. I'm I'm surprised it's I'm surprised it's below eighteen hundred right now. Uh, we we were talking the other day about. Um, 1750 all of a sudden turned into this magnet where the price would not leave 1750. Um, you know, today up $35 or so $33, you know, we maybe we broke through that. Um, so I, 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 what I would, what I would say is that you, it's, it's too hard to bet right now because you, once we break through this, I think we're gonna see these 20, $30 days in rapid sequence. And we're gonna move up over the 2000 level and, and into, into a new zone. And we're, we're gonna have a, a pretty long runway of, of people that are um, uh, not exposed whatsoever that then have to get exposed. And, and let me give you some idea. We, we just went to the Denver Gold conference, which is the biggest, I think it's kind of like the most important gold conference to go to because you have lots of face-to-face uh, -face meetings with, with all the different companies are there. And it's, it's very executive oriented. It's not really a retail conference. And uh, there was just nobody there. There was nobody there. And, and the, the CEO of, of uh, uh, Barrick Gold, who I'm quite fond of, spoke and, and I, I'm looking around and uh, he might as well have spoke at three o'clock in the morning I mean, there's no one in there and so that that tells you something there's no institutional investors there's no uh to speak of there's no hedge funds it's not popular no one owns gold so so i think i think the the reason why you have to wait for the breakout is because is because it could be today and it could be in a month and it could be in six months but when when you see it break out of this uh, of this short-term consolidation, you know, because really a year ago in, in August, we were at all-time highs and the, the, the chart said we would, we would keep moving. I mean, there was a, there was a big argument for 2,500 at the time on the chart. And so we, we consolidated there. So this is very short-term. It feels long-term. You know, if you watch it every second, it feels like an eternity, but really it's only a year. So, so I think when we turn out of this, you know, we look to eclipse the old the old high and break into new territory. 
Thanks, EB. Uh, we, we got a question on uh, color of the current deal environment. Um, you know, as as I said earlier in this presentation, uh, you know, we we have seen a very significant increase in the competitive environment for for the good assets that are out there. Um, you know, again, you know, we we uh, as as being you know really having a first mover advantage in in the existing market. You know, we've built. Uh, strong relationships with a lot of these holders, and, that, and that's that's really what the, the business of buying existing royalties is all about: is is having the the relationships and the track record in the high quality portfolio. That's that's what gets you these deals. That's what allows the Metalla to go out and buy these things. There's you know there's no database advantages. There's no um, you know you're you're not you know lifting up rocks and 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 getting lucky. It's it's just consistent. Uh, the consistent track record and the consistent ability to be able to harvest. And we're moving into a stage of our business, or we've been in really a stage of our business over this last year, where we've been able to harvest a lot of these great opportunities. Um, and we feel like we're in position to continue to do that over, over the next couple of years. And so I, I think we're, um, we're uh, in a good spot relative to you know, some of the peers in, in this current environment. Uh, we'll do we'll do one more question here. Um, and we got a question on uh, the profitability of uh, mining companies versus royalty companies. And you know what I can say to that is obviously royalty companies have great margins. Um, sometimes the margins are, are upwards of 100% because it, depending on what the royalty is, you, you're taking that cash flow right off the top um, and that cash flow is in perpetuity and it's free carry. There, there's just no real way to compare um, you know, the mining investment, in, in, in my opinion, to the royalty investment. It's, it's truly just such an amazing asset. And when you can take these assets and you can span them across, you know, 70 different projects that you have the largest mining companies in the world putting in hundreds of millions of dollars to the assets that you have exposure to free carried, providing significant organic growth. There's just no better business to be in. Um, and this is what we've been able to build. So uh, we, we're, we're, we're very excited again for, for this next year. And we thank you all for your support. Um, you know, we'll continue on here. Um, and Brett, Brett, make sure people understand the 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 mining. The, the it's it's a big mistake to use the same analysis tools for for a mining stock as for a royalty stock because you miss something that's super important. If a mining company has uh, fifty million ounces of reserves in the ground and they're mining five million ounces a year we all know that they have 10 years left to mine and they're totally out of inventory. So they got to either buy some wine or find something new and all this, this is how it goes. And during that time, the cost of uh, oil and uh, caterpillar bulldozers and, and labor and all these things is variable. So it, it can go up. So it, the mining business is really a complicated widget business. You know, in a widget business, you put things together and sell them and you have to make money on every dollar of, of revenue. And so that's that's the mining business. It's, it's quite profitable right now. I mean, a lot of these companies have, you know, 35% gross operating margins. It's pretty nice. I mean, that means six or $700 an ounce that they're making, you know, top line off, off the gold sales, which is, is pretty good when you have, a lot of them have no debt too. Okay, so I, in my book, I, I wrote, by the way, this is available in uh, hardcover now from Amazon, recently available in hardcover, and, and, and it'll fit in a stocking, you know, just, just so everyone knows. So, so I explained that the, the way to value the royalty company is totally different because it's, the royalty business is not a widget business. It, it, it's, it, looking at a PE ratio for the royalty business is, is absolutely useless. And, and the reason why is because you, you have uh, a, a totally different type of accounting. What, what happens is you've got 30 years of exposure, 40 years, whatever the case may be, to ounces of gold that are going to come out of the ground that don't, you don't pay anything to get them out of the ground. So there is no, uh, you know, put the widget together and sell it. There's just sell it. And, and so everything that you've spent is on the front end. 
And, and I could compare it to real estate, where if you look at a real estate trust and you look at a PE ratio, it's very confusing because, because there's a depreciation component that goes into to amortizing the cost of the royalty, similar to owning an apartment building or something. And, and so it's it, the way to look at these businesses, that's the bigger royalty companies, smaller, whatever, is the, is the price compared to net asset value. Because the net asset value is all the ounces of gold in the ground uh, combined into one compared against the stock price. And so that is the metric. And in my book, I wrote in very specific detail about, about where to find that metric, how to use it, and how it's a very fair way to rank companies. Because every ounce of gold that comes out of the ground for the royalty company is gone. Okay, so that reduces the net asset value. And so that ratio keeps tabs on what a company is worth. And consider that instead of a PE ratio, because the PE ratio will be very deceptive. And, and, it, it, and in the end, it won't tell you anything that helps you determine if it's a good time or a bad time to own the stock. The net asset value is, is, the, is the key metric. And it's not the case so much for the mining companies. It's very different. Yes, and, and, and again, this is uh, just an incredible opportunity right now because you, you know, we've, we, we've had a, a really a good gold price. I mean, uh, $1,700, $1,800. I mean, the balance sheets of the major mining companies is uh, in the best shape that, I mean, the best shape really I've seen in the last two decades. Um, and, and, and yet at the same time, uh, you know, we're seeing contrarian signals of, of maximum pessimism in the gold equities. And for whatever reason that is, you know, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly why that is. But um, what, what it is, is an opportunity. It's, it's an opportunity because you've got an incredible macro setup. You've got a pretty good gold price that, that and, and you've got equities that are being mispriced, um, you know, along with that. Even the royalty companies, the 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 blue chip royalty companies as a group are all, I would say, you know, the good ones at least are very attractively priced at at this moment. Um, and there hasn't been very many times for these types of setups. So, you know, again, great opportunity. You know, this is the the best entry point. You know, I believe I've, as I said before, we've had in the last um, three years from a P to Nav um, perspective, and um, you know, both both myself and UEB have been buying in the market at higher prices as we um, you know, didn't even think it would make it down to, to these levels. But I mean, they're just incredible levels to, to be able to capitalize on over time. So um, with that, we'll, we'll conclude uh, our, our webinar. Thank you all for joining us again. And uh, we hope you have a rest of the good evening. Thank you. <laughs>